स्टूडेंट्स दिस इज इकोनॉमिक्स रिविजन लेसन फॉर ग्रेड ट्वेल्व द लेसन इज द सेकंड रिविजन लेसन ऑफ यूनिट वन व्हिच इज अबाउट द मेथड्स ऑफ स्टडिंग इकोनॉमिक्स देर आर फोर मेथड्स ऑफ स्टडिंग इकोनॉमिक्स कॉल्ड डिडक्टिव एंड इंडक्टिव रीजनिंग इकोनॉमिक लॉज पॉजिटिव एंड नॉर्माटिव स्टेटमेंट्स from the method of studying economics let's see the first method of studying economics called deductive and inductive reasoning logical reasonings are used to explain causes and the effects of some factors first of all let's see deductive deductive when we say deductive reasoning it enables us to reach at a particular conclusion or specific conclusion standing from the general statement or assumptions that means the deductive reasoning enables us to move from general to particular most economic theories are developed using the deductive reasoning the steps involved in in the deductive reasoning are first identifying the problem and its variables once if we identified the problems and its variables second we will rush to defining the technical terms and making the assumptions this is the second step to use the deductive reasoning in economics suddenly once we define the technical terms and makes assumptions then we will develop logical hypothesis through logical deduction and after the logical deduction and constructing the hypothesis then we will rush to testing these hypotheses and the destination or the final result of the deductive reasoning is comparing these factors with the economic principles with economic principles now let's see the inductive reasoning which is the opposite of deductive reasoning inductive reasoning enables us to reach at a general conclusion standing from particular issues or assumptions so this inductive reasoning is a movement from particular or specific issue to a general statement or conclusion simply it makes a movement from particular to general now let's see the steps involved in in inductive reasoning first we have to identify the problems we have to identify the problems once if we identify the problems then we will rush to defining the technical terms and variables related to this problem and the third step is collecting data we can collect data in different ways from the primary sources or secondary sources and after collecting this data on a specific variables we will go to developing the hypothesis by processing the available data the third type of logical reasoning is integrated deductive and inductive reasoning which is a combination of both the deductive and inductive reasoning is modern economists begin by developing economic hypothesis through logical deduction and then empirically they test them through statistical or econometric models this is an integrated deductive and inductive method or reasoning now let's see the second method of studying economics called positive versus normative economics the positive economics deals with facts in principle it might be true or false it is fact if we can verify that fact whether it is true or false yes or no then that statement is positive economic statement positive economic statement the positive economic statement focus on factors or the cause and effect relationship and it is concerned on what is in an economy while the normative economic statements cons are concerned on what should be 
in an economy. But the positive economic statements are concerned on what is in an economy. Another distinction between the positive and normative economic statements are positive economic statements can be verified using economic principles and laws. We can verify economic laws using economic laws. We can verify positive economic statements using economic principles. So once if we can verify them, we can consider such type of statements as positive economic. But these positive economics does not involve value judgments. They are not dependent on individuals' attitudes or perceptions. Unlike the positive economic statements, the normative economic statements are deals with economic policies that benefit a society. And the normative economic statement embodies subjective feeling about what should be in an economy. That means it involves value judgment. It is dependent on the perception or attitudes of individuals. An economic statement which is true for one party may be false for the other. No one can verify these normative economic statements. So the, the normative economic statements incorporates value judgment and they cannot be verified using economic laws and principles and the underlies expressions of support for particular economic policies. When we see the examples for positive economic statements, first of all, other things remain unchanged as price of orange increases, people tend to buy less unit of orange. This statement is positive economic statement because with the rise in the price of egg, with the rise in the price of egg, then the quantity demanded for egg will decline. And with the fall in the price of egg, the fall in the price of egg, then the quantity demanded for egg will increase. So this statement is true because this statement is supported by the law of demand. The law of demand states that other things remain unchanged. Theta is paribus. With increase in price of a commodity, quantity demanded for that commodity will decline. And with the fall in the price of a commodity, quantity demanded will increase. So there is an inverse relationship between the changes in the direction of price and the changes in the direction of quantity demanded. Quantity demanded. So we can support this information by the law of demand. Hence, we can consider it as positive economic statement. Second, the sun rises in the east. It's obvious the sun rises in the east. So this statement is true. And this statement is positive statement. Positive statement. But if a statement states that if the sun rises in the west, this statement is also positive economic statement because it is false. The sun never rises in the west. Remember here, being false is not a guarantee for being normative economic statement. So if we prove, if we can verify the statement, whether it is true or false, though it is false, the statement is considered as positive statement, positive statement. So again, in the first example, if a statement states that other things remain unchanged as price of orange increases, people tend to buy more, more units of a commodity. This statement is also a positive statement because it is false, because it is false. Another example, the unemployment rate in Eritrea is higher than Ethiopia. We can calculate the unemployment rates using the measurement or the indexes of unemployment. So by making the assessment or by measuring the unemployment rates, we can exactly explain about the unemployment rates in Eritrea and the unemployment rates in Ethiopia. So this statement is positive statement because it is either true or false. It, 
the unemployment rate in Eritrea is higher than in Ethiopia or the unemployment rate in Ethiopia is higher than Eritrea. Since we can verify it using the measurement or the tools of unemployment, this, this statement is considered as positive economic statement. Another example, the African economy is better than Western economy. This statement is positive statement because it is false because it is not better than the Western economy. Using the indexes used to measure the level of economic performance of countries using the GDP and GNP, we can calculate the level of performance of economic performance of countries. So this statement is false and we can consider it as an example of positive statement. When we see examples for normative statements, these are statements which are subjective in their nature. For example, governments should provide subsidies for disabled. One party may, may give such a statement because government has to provide subsidies for the disabled because they cannot work as a normal person. But the other party may suggest another, another idea. Government should not provide subsidies because disab disability is not inability. So we cannot say this one is true and this one is false. Or this one is correct and this one is incorrect. Hence, it leads to subjective judgments. Such a statement is called normative statement. Another example, the new economic teacher is better than the previous one. We don't know who is the new one and who is the older one. Even though we know the new economic teacher and the old one, a teacher which is better for one student is, may not be better for the other. It is dependent on the perception, the attitudes of individuals. So it leads to subjective judgment. Another example for normative economic statements, communism is a true way of life. One party may say communism is a true way of life and the other may say capitalism is a true way of life. Which one is correct? We cannot say this one is correct because it depends on individual attitudes, perceptions and the likes. Now, let's see the other method of studying economics called economic models. Economic models are abstractions of the real world. They are a mirror reflection of the real world. It's difficult to understand all the characteristics, the behaviors of the real world. Hence, we are expected to construct economic models. For example, it's difficult to identify the problem or the behavior of the world's people. But by taking the behavior of some people, we can explain about the nature of people, about the behavior of people, about the problem of people. This is accomplished through models. Again, in order to identify problems of your school, we don't need to make some interviews with all of the students. But by taking some interviews of some students, we can explain the behavior or the problem of your school students. This is accomplished using economic models. But economic models do not represent part of the real world in entirely. Economic models are built for the purpose of analysis and prediction. We can make analysis using economic data. It enables us to make economic analysis. Economic models enables us to make prediction. For example, by taking the 
previous year GDP and the last 10 years Ethiopian GDP, we can explain about the future GDP of Ethiopia. So economic models are built for the purpose of prediction. Finally, economic models are represented in the form of functions, schedules, and graphs. All the graphs that you saw in your grade 11 textbooks are economic models. All the functions that you saw in your grade 11 textbook, economics textbook, are economic models. All, all the curves that all the schedules that you saw in your grade 11 textbook are economic models. For example, let's see the economic model of demand. This is the demand for orange by one household in one Warada. Here, when the price of a kilogram of orange is per 10, the quantity demanded for orange is 4 kilogram. When the price of a kilogram of orange increased to per 20, then the quantity demanded for orange reduced to 3 kg. When the price of a kilogram of orange increased to 30, then the quantity demanded for orange declined to 2 kg. This shows us other things remain unchanged. With the rise in the price of orange, then the quantity demanded for orange will decline. And with the fall in the price of orange, then the quantity demanded for orange will increase. So other things remain unchanged. There is an inverse relationship between the price of a kilogram of orange and the quantity demanded for orange. So this is a schedule that represents the individual demand schedule and it is a typical example for economic models. Another example for economic model, this is the demand curve and this is a graphical representation of individual demand schedule here when the price of a kilogram of orange is per 10 the quantity demand for orange is 4 kilogram when the price of a kilogram of orange increased to per 20 the quantity demanded for orange decreased to 3 kilogram and when the price of a kilogram of orange is 30 per then the quantity demanded for orange reduced to 2 kilogram now by joining these points together we can construct the demand curve and this is individual demand curve. This is a model that is represented in the form of curve and typical example for demand curve. Okay, now let's rise to the last method of studying economics called economic laws. Economic laws describe how human beings behave as a producer or as a consumer. These economic laws are conditional statements of tendencies. Economic laws are dependent on some factors, some preconditions. Without fulfilling these preconditions, economic laws are not applicable. Economic laws are stated based on an assumption called ceteris paribus. Ceteris paribus is a Latin word, a Latin word which has a similar meaning in English called other things remain unchanged or constant. That means we, we can construct economic laws by putting all other factors other than the indicated variable unchanged or constant. Now, let me show you one economic law called the law of demand. The law of demand states that ceteris paribus with increase in price of a commodity quantity demanded will will increase and with the fall in the price of a commodity quantity demanded will will increase so there is an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded but this holds true if all other things remain constant or unchanged if there's a change in income of consumer then the law is not applicable for example if you do have timber and the price of a single egg is tuber. If you spend the whole timber for the purchase of egg, you can buy five eggs. Further, if you have timber again, and if the price of a single egg increases to bar five, again, if you spend the whole income for the purchase of egg, you can buy only two eggs. So, 
other things remain unchanged especially if your income remains unchanged with increasing price of egg then you will buy less amount of egg but this holds true if there is no change in income of consumer but if there is a change in income of consumer for example if your income increase from 10 to 1 million with increase in price of egg from 2 birth to 5 you can buy more of an egg which is against the law of demand so it is written based on this assumption called ceteris paribus another feature of the economic law is economic laws are not completely exact and definite completely exact and definite economic laws are scientific in nature we can say something is scientific if it involves the cause and effects if something involves causes and effects we can consider it science for example let's see from this law an increase in price of a commodity is the cause and the effect is a decline in quantity demanded the effect is a decline in quantity demanded another example the cause is a decline in price of a commodity and the effect is an increase in quantity demanded so this economic law involves the cause and effects relationship so from this we can consider that economic laws are scientific in nature economic laws are scientific in nature finally economic laws are not permanent and general economic laws are not permanent and general that means economic law that is applicable in one country is not applicable in another economic law that is applicable in ethiopia is not applicable in america so it is dependent on the countries or several factors so economic laws are not permanent and general this is all about the second lesson stay safe stay home thank you